Shalom, Izzy here with Holy Language Institute at holylanguage.com. I wanted to show you a neat excerpt from um, some ancient Jewish history that uh, shed some light on the Gospels. And also there's a, another really neat excerpt in this little passage that shows the faithfulness of God. And uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is called a Mishnah. In other words, it's, it's like a verse, a big verse. And uh, it's from, well, it's actually, it's from the Mishnah. It's kind of funny because you have this like, this set of uh, Jewish writings and they're called the Mishnah, but then it's actually like several thousand Mishnayot. Um, that's the plural. And basically it's lots of um, history and uh, how the Torah was originally interpreted by the Jewish community. And it was, it, was all, it was all memorized and communicated word of mouth for generations. And then it was finally written down um, in the late, uh, the late 100s because it was in danger of, uh, of being lost. So this is a, this is a historical excerpt from a tractate called Ta'anit, which uh, Ta'anit is a fast. So this is the tractate about when the uh, people of Israel would fast and how they would do that and what that looked like. And there were all kinds of different fasts. There was fasting for rain. Um, there were fasts on specific days when a lot of bad things went down in Israel's history, like if you've heard of the Ninth of Av, for instance. And uh, there is a, some, there's some related history in here. And you know, one, of the, one of the reasons I love the Mishnah is that, well, for one reason, just because I love history. But then for another reason, um, because this is, this is history from the Second Temple era. So this is a history of the Jewish world of, of Yeshua, of Jesus of Nazareth, and uh, his disciples who went on to write the New Testament. So I love the Mishnah because it, it, it sheds light on the New Testament, and it helps, to, uh, it helps us to see the Jewish Jesus in his original context. And uh, if you're a disciple, of Yeshua of Nazareth, then I'm sure that's, uh, that's meaningful to you also and, and hopefully of note. So let me give you a little example here. All right, so um, this is in chapter 4, and it's the fifth Mishnah in, uh, in this tractate. And uh, apparently there were, there, were nine, there were nine times in the year when specific groups of people would bring wood for the, uh, for the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. And it lists them here. And uh, we're not going to read all of those, but I wanted to point out two to you specifically. Um, one here is that it mentions the family of David of the tribe of Judah. Now, what's interesting about this is, see that little, little five there? It means there's a footnote. If we look at the footnote, it says, No such family is mentioned anywhere in Nehemiah nor in Ezra. And you may be wondering, why are those books mentioned? Well, you know, the Jewish people were, were exiled from the land of Israel to Babylon. There was the 70-year Babylonian exile that was prophesied by Jeremiah. And that's, you know, when, when, when the stuff in the book of Daniel happened. And then towards the end of that time period, the stuff in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah happened. So, you know, it was on Nehemiah's heart to, uh, to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and get the city walls up. And, uh, and then it was also on, on Ezra's heart to go back and help the people to not just do the same stupid things that they did the first time around that got them kicked out of the land. Um, so, you know, Ezra went back and he was teaching the Torah and he helped to create some, some systems so hopefully the people would learn the Torah and not, not, not mess up again like that. And um, that's where, you know, that was where a lot of the traditional Jewish prayers started, you know, the way the Jewish prayer service is today, um, the whole synagogue service with Torah readings, a lot of that stuff traces back to Ezra at the beginning of the Second Temple era. And if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, they, uh, they, they kept some pretty strict records of which tribe and family people were from. And so it says, you know, there were like, you know, this many thousand guys from this family and then this many people from that family. You know, maybe there was not even a hundred or maybe there was over a thousand, you know, but a very, very, um, there, were, there was a very precise head count that happened um, when the Jewish people came back. And uh, so it's interesting that this family of David never got mentioned. Now, what's interesting is that the family of David actually is mentioned in the Bible, but it's not in Ezra and Nehemiah. It is in the Gospel of Luke. We read that there was a man named Joseph. There was a man named Yosef, and uh, he lived up in the northern province of the Galil, in a town called Nazareth. And uh, apparently when it was time to register for the census, he had to uh, make the hike down to um, a city called Beit Lechem, which is literally in Hebrew, that means house of bread. It's just southeast of Jerusalem. Why? Because he was of the family of David. So isn't that interesting? The family of David is mentioned in, um, in this Mishnah, 
as being a group that actually was one of the nine groups that brought wood for the, um, the, the, the fires on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. And then um, it's, it's also mentioned uh, in the Gospel of Luke. So in all probability, Joseph came from this family that, um, that contributed. So that's that's neat. Maybe it just set, maybe it just sheds a little bit of light for you. You know, it's like, oh, Yeshua's adopted father. He belonged to this family. This is something that they did. Now, did Joseph himself do that? We don't know. We don't know how big the family was. We didn't. We don't know how spread out they were. But um, but there's some history there for you that apparently the family of David. You know, it's it's it's, it's a even though it's not mentioned in Ezra and Nehemiah, it is mentioned in um, in Jewish history. Now, another really fascinating family here is the family of. You know, I'm going to say, I'm going to like just say it the really English way. Jonadab, son of Rechab. Or how would you say it? <laughs> um, in Hebrew, I'll show you the Hebrew here. It's um, Yonadav ben Rechav. Well, that's how you say it in Hebrew. Yonadav ben Rechav. And what's fascinating about this family is they were mentioned also in the book of Jeremiah. There's actually a story about them. They were the good guys in the story. I highlighted a couple of the sections of the story. I'm not just I'm not going to read it, read it to you word for word. I'll just kind of give you a paraphrased version. So basically, God tells um, Jeremiah, okay, so there's this the family of the Rechabites. Go and um, bring them to the temple and uh, tell them to have some wine. So he brings them into the temple. He says, you know, he sets cu cups and jugs of wine before them, invites them to have a drink, and they say no. And then they explain it's because our ancestor, this guy. Now what's interesting is um. In the Mishnah, he's mentioned as Yonadav. In, in the book of Jeremiah, he's mentioned by the fuller version of his name, Yehonadav. Or, and basically, like if you say that fast, Yehonadav, it's just Yonadav. Um, I'll give you another example of that, actually, because this is important. Um, so Joshua, do you know how to say Joshua in Hebrew? It's Yehoshua, except if you're like an Israeli and you say that kind of smoother, you, say, you don't say Ye Yehoshua, and you sure don't say Yehoshua. Yehoshua is a really, really bad pronunciation. Um, Israelis say Yehoshua, and uh, if they say it really fast, they say Yeshua. And you know, I, I, I've heard Israelis and I've heard rabbis, and they'll refer to Joshua and they'll call him Yeshua. So, anyways, um, which is you know a name that um, I'm sure you're familiar with. So, anyways, this is a little example of how that happened, and it wasn't just with the name Joshua. You have Yonadav, and then. He's also, he referred to as Yonadav. I mean, it's just spelled differently, but, you know, end up saying the same. Anyway, so they say, yeah, so our ancestor, he told us, um, don't drink wine, don't build houses, or, you know, plant crops or vineyards, just live in tents. And so that's what they did. Um, and then they had to, so they, they said, you know, we're, well, we're in Jerusalem because King Nebuchadnezzar attacked the country. <laughs> so we're here for our own safety. And... Um, Interestingly enough, this story doesn't end there. So, so Jeremiah does this thing that God tells him to do, and then he uses it, God uses it as an object lesson. And he basically says, look, like these guys do what, um, what their ancestor told them, but you, but you don't do what I tell you to do. Why don't you be more like them, basically? And then um, it, it, finish, it finishes with this, uh, with this beautiful prophecy that Jeremiah gives this specific family. He says, you've obeyed your ancestor, Yonadav, in every respect, following all his instructions. Therefore, this is what the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Yonadav, son of Rechav, will always have descendants who serve me. In other words, your family is never going to get wiped out. Even right now, while we're sitting here in Jerusalem and the Babylonians are just wiping out the whole country, um, you guys are going to survive and your family is going to last forever. And you're not just going to last forever. You're always going to have a relationship with me and people who serve me. Beautiful! And what's, what's especially beautiful is we don't know what happened to these guys, you know, in the biblical text um, after the beginning of the Second Temple era. But here we see that even at the end of the Second Temple era, like 500 years later, this family was still around, they were still serving God, and uh, apparently they were even one of the nine groups that brought the wood up to Jerusalem for the, for the fires on the altar. So anyways, um, just, just praise God for, uh, for his word and for his faithfulness. And, uh, and for how, you know, there's this, this old prophecy that he made to a specific family, and, um, and it came true. There's one more interesting thing here I could uh, point out. It mentions there are some people who are uncertain of their tribal descent. So that's another example of how, you know, most people were really quite certain of which tribe they belonged to. And uh, then there were the occasional people who, who weren't certain. As a little side note, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but there's this hilarious lie out there that the Jewish people aren't really the Jewish people, that they're actually descended from converts, that they're not like ethnically descended from the original nation of Israel. 
and um, it's really really easy to disprove that go to a go to a synagogue any synagogue any saturday morning and uh, there will be seven people who go up to read from the torah the first person is a Cohen. In other words, he's a priest, a, dis a direct descendant of Aaron who lived 4,000 years ago. And uh, the second person will be a Levi, a Levite, someone who descended from, like, even farther back, like Levi, like the son of Jacob. Um, like the Jewish people, that's the way it's been for the last couple thousand years. And you can, you can read about that tradition also in, 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 in the Mishnah and other um, historical texts like that. So, you know, basically, if someone says, yeah, the Jewish people today, they're all just, dis you know, they're just white and they're just descended from converts. I'm like, well, you know, I go to synagogue every Saturday and the first, we keep very, very um, accurate um, historical record of who descended from Levi and Aaron. So are you saying those people weren't? That somewhere along the line, they just made that up? Um, do you have any historical, like, documentation to prove that somewhere along the way, we just made that up? Um, and here's the thing, like these guys are the backbones of the community, so to speak, the priests and the Levites, you know, and um, that's just that's just the direct um, line lineage through the father. Um, every every time they have daughters, those daughters, you know, they might marry into other families of um, Kohanim and Levim, as we'd say in Hebrew, or they just marry into regular Israelite families. So basically, like everybody, everybody in the Jewish community is descended from Aaron and from Levi. So really. You know, it's kind of, a, if you really want to make an accusation against the whole Jewish community, both in the land of Israel and outside, and say that they're all white and they're all just descended from, you know, converts, well, the, the, the onus of proof is really on you to prove that, um, that, that this ancient tradition in the synagogue really isn't so ancient, and that somewhere along the way we just made it up that these guys are actually descended from Levi and Aaron, so... Um, that's actually one of the th one of the other things I covered. Um, I, I you know this whole thing telling you about the families of David and of Jonadab, son of Rechab, to use a really English version of their names. Um, th this is the takeaway from a Mishnah snapshots lesson I just finished filming. It's lesson fifty two in our course. We're just I'm just going through the Mishnah and I'm giving these snapshots, these highlights of places that help us to better understand um, the, uh, the 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 world of um, of Jesus, you know, who is Jewish, and his disciples who went on to write the New Testament. So if that's something that interests you, I'd love to have you come and learn more. Um, check out our Mishnah Snapshots course at uh, holylanguage.com. And uh, we covered a lot of other things in Lesson 52. Um, I'm not even going to get into all of them. One of the things we covered is we looked at um, uh, the Mishnah that talks about the five bad things that happened on the 17th of Tammuz in uh, the history of the nation of Israel, and then also the five bad things that happened on the 9th of Av in the summer, which was about three weeks later, including the destruction of both temples. So, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe you're new to um, Jewish stuff or to the Hebrew calendar. Maybe you're like, what what, what, what was the name of that, Tammuz? Um, the 9th of Av, what, what, what's that? Which months are those? You know, I, I know about, you know, August, September, October, but what's this? Um, you know, if, if that's you, I, I want to welcome you to, to learn more about the Hebrew calendar because there are some very big things that have happened in history on specific days on that calendar. And, uh, you know, of course, we have things like the death of the Messiah on Passover and, um, and the, the, uh, the pouring out of his spirit on the Festival of Weeks. Um, but there's going to be more that hap happens in the future. You know, we, we, we learn about some of the really bad things that happen on specific days. And, I mean, you know, I think it might be smart. It might be smart for us to know when those days are even today, so that we can just stay alert in prayer. What did Yeshua say? You know, he said, you're still sleeping and resting? Like, wake up. Stay alert in prayer. Um, pray that you won't enter into temptation. So, you know, um, if there are days in history when a lot of really bad stuff went down, maybe that's not a good day for you to be like binge eating or, you know, um, having that second glass of wine or just sitting, like, you know you know what I mean? Like, maybe that's a good day to be really spiritually alert and just spend some extra time in the presence of God. And uh, maybe, you know, say an extra prayer for yourself and your family um, and for, and for, the, and for uh, the people of Israel and the nations. You know, God loves the nations of the world. He loves you. And um, he, he, he made his calendar for a reason. All the way back in Genesis chapter 1. It says, God made the sun, the moon, and the stars for four things. For days, for years, for signs. Notice that. For signs, that's the Jewish calendar, and for seasons. And the Hebrew word for seasons, it doesn't mean the four seasons. Um, 
it means it, it's the Hebrew word for the appointed times. The Hebrew word there is moedim. So God made God made at the very beginning, before there was anybody, God made the sun, the moon, and the stars for signs and for His appointed times. So all the way back to the very beginning of creation, God made His calendar, which uh, today is is the Jewish calendar. So, anyways, I just want to uh, invite you to learn more about that and uh, uh, learn to synchronize yourself more closely with the Creator. You know, walk with Him every day, and uh, and know the times and seasons that we are in. All right. Well, I hope to see you at holylanguage.com and check out our Mission of Snapshot series. And uh, thanks for joining me in this conversation. And I hope it leaves you praising God for his historical faithfulness to his people and his promises.